Assalamu alaikum. alaikum. No, this is a weak salam. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu wa salahu rabbuhu wa rahmatan lil alameen Today inshallah we are honored to have Dr. Abdullah Hakim Kweq and Dr. Red up there to talk about this uh, important topic which is da'wah at the time of crisis and hardship They say They say Don't you ever give the mic to a teacher or a preacher and today, mashallah, we have both. Because once they take the mic, they never give it back. <laughs> so, inshallah, I'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction about the uh, two speakers. Then we'll give the program. Then we'll start right away, inshallah. Dr. Abdullah Hakim Kweq is a historian, social activist, and a religious leader of African and Native uh, American descent. He has traveled to over 58 countries doing research and delivering lectures to various communities. His qualification in Islamic studies comes from his uh, BA from the Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia. His history background is shaped by an MA and a PhD degree from the History Department of the University of Toronto, Canada. And this is just a reminder that today is the last day of the early bird special registration for uh, Dr. Quick's uh, uh, seminar, Western Sunrise. So please, you can register on both sides of the uh, entrances, inshallah. Dr. Rida be there. We are also especially honored to have Dr. Rida with us. He's a Muslim scholar, imam, chaplain, instructor, professor, da'i, translator, among many other things. He currently, currently serves as a professor of Islamic studies, Islamic sciences at the University of Alberta, a member of Rashid's Dawa Committee, an instructor with Al Maghrib. He has a PhD in Islamic Studies from Al Azhar University. He served as an Imam and a chaplain in a number of massages in Canada. And most importantly, uh, he was my teacher in 2001. Okay, the program. Inshallah, we're going to start with Dr. Quick. Uh, uh, he's going to talk for roughly 40 minutes. We'll try to hold you to this. Then we'll have Dr. Rida be there, inshallah, talking for a, about 35 to 40 minutes. Then in the remaining time until Maghrib, inshallah, we will have um, an open uh, session for questions and answers. So without further ado, inshallah, Dr. Quick. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa liya salihin. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh khatab al-anbiya'i wa mursaleen. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala abdika wa rasoolika muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Wa ba'd. All praises are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. And surely Allah is the friend and protector of the righteous. And I bear witness that Allah is one and has no partners, and that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, is his servant and his last messenger. May Allah always and constantly send peace and blessings to Muhammad, to his companions, to his family, to all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, my beloved brothers and sisters, I begin with the greeting words of the righteous, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it is a great privilege to be here with you. And I want to bring you salams from your brothers and sisters in the deep south, in Cape Town, in the furthest point uh, in the African continent, uh, what people call down under, like Australia is considered to be down under. We're going into the summer, and there, they're going into the winter. So it's the other side of the planet. And so I bring you salams from the people there and feed feelings of solidarity. And it is a great privilege that I am able to be with Muslims in different parts of the world. 
And this is uh, another example of the uh, importance of the words of the Prophet Muhammad who did not speak from himself. And in these times that we are living in today, it is extremely important for us to go back to our foundations, go back to the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go back to the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and then you can find something that you can grip, hold on to. The times we are living in are confusing times. For many young people, those who embrace Islam, and they watch the television, they look at the media, they see a negative image being painted about Islam and Muslims. And they wonder about what the actual situation is in the world. When they travel to different parts of the world, they see there are so many Muslims and they see positive things, but there is an image being projected that is a negative one. The Prophet ﷺ did not speak from himself. And in an authentic hadith reported in at tabarani the Prophet, peace be upon him, was reported to have said, Yakunu fi akhir zaman the Prophet said, There will come near the end of time great liars, unbelievable liars, and they will come to you with a type of speech that neither you nor your parents have ever heard of before. You've never heard of this speech before. And then the Prophet said, beware of them. Beware that they take you astray and beware that they put you into a fitna. And a fitna is a trial, it's a test, it's a tribulation, it's a confusion, a gray area. You're not sure which way to go. And Sadaqa Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam, it has come to pass. Digital technology. The age that we are living in now, human beings have the ability to uh, make what is real seem false and make what is false seem real. They can take my picture, they can take me, and they can put words in my mouth and they can make it look as though I said it and I didn't even say it. They can doctor the picture. They can doctor the words. And then they send the tape to Al Jazeera or something and suddenly I said something that I didn't say. The Prophet did not speak from himself. They will come to you with a type of speech that neither you nor your parents have ever heard of before. You've never heard of this before. We have to try constantly to grip our reality, to talk to each other, to try to find out from our own sources what is happening in the world, and then to connect that with the Prophet, peace be upon him, to see what he would have done in the times of darkness. What would he have done in a crisis where he felt a lot of pressure? He felt that people were saying things about him and his companions that were not true. Part of the reality that we are recognizing, those of us who have been blessed to travel, to visit Muslims in different places, Islam is now rising at an amazing rate. What is happening now is unprecedented in our history. I recently was in Australia, and there in Australia, the chief of an Aboriginal tribe in the city of Melbourne came to us. They are the original people who lived in Australia, and they are embracing Islam now. The Maori people, known in New Zealand, are also embracing, embracing Islam. There are people in Greece, in Poland, in Norway, in Sweden, in places that we never thought possible, <coughs> embracing Islam. Quiet as it's kept right here in Canada, we have information now 
and we are getting calls from Inuvik to the north of you and Iqalut in the Nunavut province that the Inuit people are embracing Islam as well. This is a change. This is a change and, and, and recently we had some Muslims in Toronto from France. You know the French Muslims are under tremendous pressure. They won't let you wear the veil. They, won't, you, they don't even want us to cover their hair. They pressurize Muslims so much to live in France and we try to see why would they be pressurizing Muslims? Why are they afraid of Muslims who are praying? They're fasting. When they practice Islam, they stop taking drugs. They stop robbing stores. They become honest. What are you afraid of? The reality is, in France, right now, 30%, 30% of children of people under 20 years old are Muslims. One in every three in France. In Paris and Marseille, two large cities, 45% of the people under 20 years old are Muslims, 45%. In Belgium, in Holland, they looked at the hospitals and they did a census in the hospital and they found that 50% of the babies born in Holland and Belgium are Muslims, 50%. One out of every two children born in the hospitals in Belgium and in Holland. Also, we find that in the UK, just a few decades ago, 30 years ago, the population of Muslims was about 82,000. Now it's 2.5 million. That's 30 years. 2.5 million. Germany, Muslims are 16%. Russia, Muslims are 20%. That's a good thing, especially for those who believe in God, those who respect Jesus and Mary, may Allah be pleased with them. That's a good thing for those who pray, for those who fast. But there is another element in society who are not happy. They are not happy with this. Because the more people who embrace Islam, means there are less people who will drink alcohol. There are less people who will be taking drugs. There are less people who will, be, who will be involved in fornication and adultery. There are less people who will go to the casino. And so it can become a problem. The money will go down. So for this minority of people who are controlling many things in our society, it is not a good sign. And so they, because they control the media, they also pressurize us and try to give a negative picture of a Muslim. And some people said, well, this is a difficult time. Look at the names that they're calling us. They say you fundamentalist, or they say you Islamists. They make up words every month. And they put new words and make up things and try to make movies. And they had a whole set of movies uh, where the bad guys became the Muslims. This is a brainwashing uh, program in order to put fear in the hearts of the people. To be afraid to accept the very way of life that will save them will save them from polytheism, save them from drugs, save them from alcoholism, save them from racism and confusion. And so in this difficult situation, this is the time when the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they would seek refuge in their Lord and they would, on earth, they would go to the Prophet ﷺ, the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially when the times got difficult. And when we go back to the early Meccan period, we find a very similar situation as today. It is reported that in the early Meccan period, Muslims were being tortured and being killed and chased out of their homes.
But the Prophet, peace be upon him, he continued giving the message. He continued to go forward. And so they said, we need to do something against him. Just like today. We need to think up something to say about him that will be a negative thing. So that when people hear his name or they look at him, they'll turn the other way. So they went down to their nadi or their clubhouse near the Kaaba and they had a meeting. This is what they would call today a think tank, the situation room. And so they went into the think tank with one of their leaders, Al Walid ibn al Mughira. And they went to Al Walid and they said, okay, now we have to get a strategy against this man. What can we say? And so they said to Walid, maybe we can call him a kahin. Let's call him a kahin. And a kahin is like a wizard, it's like a male magician. The ones that are around the Kaaba and whatnot, very official. It's an official, uh, you call in English, you say wizard. Okay, so, but then Al Walid, although he was living in Jahiliya, the Arabs love truth. They love to tell the truth. They, at least they had that quality amongst them. So Al Walid said, no. I'm putting it into our words. He, he's not a Kahin. He doesn't have the appearance of a Kahin. And, no, that's wrong. They said, okay, maybe we should say he is Majnoon. Let's say he's crazy. But Walid also answered, no, you cannot say that because he doesn't have the actions of a crazy person. He's calm. The words that come out of him are he's calm, he's relaxed. That's not the right description. So they said, okay, maybe we should say he is shy. Let's say he is a poet. But Walid said, no, because this thing that he's reading, it's not shi'ar, it's not poetry. Because the Arabs knew their poetry. And in those days, they would speak in poetry, uh, where you have certain rhythm in your language. So you have poetry and prose. That's what we say today. Poetry is rhymes, and prose is like telling a story. The Quran is coming in rhymed prose. Nobody speaks like that. You know today you have amongst the young people, you know the rappers, they rap in America. They rap in all languages now, even they rap in Somali and Arabic and Urdu and everybody's trying to rap. What is a rapper? A rapper is somebody who he, he keeps talking and it's in rhythm, right? But usually because it's difficult to do that, he ends up saying some crazy things that don't make any sense. But these words coming out of the Prophet Sallallahu it made sense. It tells a story. And it's in rhythm. We don't speak like this. So it's not poetry. Then they said, why don't we say he is Sahir? Let's say he's a, he's a magician. And then Walid said, no, he's not. He doesn't like Nafatati for Ruqad. He's not like the women who blow in knots. And he's not a magician. So they said, okay, what are we going to say? Finally, they agreed we will call him Sahir. We'll call him a magician because he breaks up families. And that is the chief occupation of the magician, to separate husband from wife, parents from children. So let's call him the Sahih. So the word went out. And so the propaganda began to spread. And there are a number of individuals who were leading this. From this group of people, there was one person who was one of the worst against the prophets himself. His name was Al-As ibn Iwail al-Sahim. And this man would follow the Prophet, peace be upon him. And as the Prophet was going to the different Arab tribes, when he finished, he would say, this man is Abtaq. This man is useless. He's an Abtaq. Now when you say this, an Abtaq means somebody who is cut off. It's a man who has no sons. He has no male offsprings. And in a tribal society like this, if you do not have males who can fight for you, who can sing your praises, who represent you in their genealogy, then in a sense, you're cut off. And so he spread this thing about the Prophet 
And this must have hurt Rasulullah It is a hurtful thing to say. In the same way, it's hurtful thing when they accuse Muslims today of violence and genocide and hurting innocent people. It hurts us because we know this is not our religion. We know that the main message of the Prophet was Rahmatan lil Alameen. He was a mercy for all of humanity, all of the worlds. So it hurts us. And this must have hurt Rasulullah when they called him this terrible name. And it is reported that the Prophet in his sleep woke up, Jibreel came to him and revealed a chapter, a mighty chapter of the Quran. He revealed this to the Prophet. The Prophet smiled, informed his wife that Jibreel had revealed to him, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Al Rajim, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Inna Aatainak Al Kawthar, Fasalli Le Rabbika Wanhar, Inna Shaniyak Huwa Al Abtar. Allah revealed, Inna Aatainak Al Kawthar. Verily, we have given you Al Kawthar. We have given you an abundance. So pray to your Lord and sacrifice. In the Shariaka, who will abduct? The one who insults you, he will be cut off. The revelation of this chapter is a miracle. This is a standing miracle which we are witnessing right now up until today. It is the shortest chapter in the Quran. Ten words. And I can believe that most of you, how many people here have memorized al kawthar Raise your hand. Everybody, right? We're all hafad of this chapter. Because when you want to make a fast salad, right? You do nas and falak and ahad and kawthar and well, ask, right, and go up and down, it's fast one. <laughs> Express a lot, they call it, in some places. This is the shortest chapter in the Quran, but it is expanding, and expanding, and expanding, and expanding, and will continue to grow until the day of resurrection. How is this possible? <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, Verily, we have given you al kawtha which has come to us in our traditions as a tree in paradise, or as a river in paradise, and this river flows into the watering place, the haud, on the day of resurrection. Its liquid is white, the whitest as milk, sweet as honey, colder than ice. If you drink it once, you'll never be thirsty again. But also, the Sahaba and the scholars looked at this word. al kautha the setup in the Arabic language, means it is a mutlaq, ghayru mahdud. It is a word that is what we call open-ended. It is kathura, it is an abundance. It also means we have given you, O Muhammad Wasallam. We have given you an abundance. We have given you something which is amazing, which will never stop. What is it that he gave him? Number one, he was given kalima la ilaha illallah. And with this kalima, he was connected to Allah Azza wa Jal, creator of the heavens and the earth, created, you know, now he was connected to an eternal force. With this kalima that had his name as Muhammad Rasulullah attached to it, he is then connected to the universe. But he also had ijabat al dawah that the people began to answer, they began to follow him. His companions began to spread. He left Mecca with a smaller number. It got larger and larger. By the time he died, he had over 100,000 people with him. And it continued to spread. Within 100 years, Islam had spread all the way to China, all the way on the other side to the Atlantic Ocean, 
far north to the Caucasoid Mountains, deep south to the Swahili coast. No other religion, no other way of life has ever spread that fast and has gone to so many different people as this message given by this one person who started in Mecca by himself, in the A'atai Nakal Kalsar, Pray to your Lord and sacrifice. Kathiratul Ashab, his companions are spreading. We are people, we have embraced Islam. We have never heard of him before. We don't speak Arabic. We have no connection. There are some people now in a frozen wasteland accepting Islam for a person who live in the desert and hardly even saw it rain outside. People who live in tropical jungles. It rains every single day. They have no connection with him. But by the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal, his companions are spreading every race, every nationality, every linguistic group. It is now reaching further places than it reached before. Inna a'atayna kal kalta wa salli li rabbika wanha. Even his name, Muhammad, nobody had this name before. It was not used by the Arabs. A recent study was done and they found that the name Muhammad, it is the most popular name on earth. Because look at Muslim, how many people are called Julius Caesar? Or Jesus Christ? Some Christians, the, the Spanish say Jesus. But very few people use that name. How many people are called Alexander the Great? But we name our son, not Abdul Karim, Muhammad Abdul Karim. Not Saleh, Muhammad Saleh. I had a friend from the Sudan, his name was Muhammadain, two Muhammads. <laughs> He was Olad and Neil, he was Egyptian, Sudanian, and Olad and Neil. <laughs> Another person on his passport, because it had his grandfather, it said, Muhammad, 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 three of them. <laughs> so now, this man, whose name was not being used, has the most popular name on the face of the planet Earth, but the person that insulted him, Al-As ibn Wa'id. How many people know this name Al-As? Go amongst the Arabs and see. Call the name amongst the scholars. The only time you would be connected with this name is his son, Amr ibn Al-As, or his grandson, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al-As, radiallahu anhu. That's the only way you know his name. But Al-As is cut off. What did the verse say? Inna a'atayna kal kalta fa salli li rabbika wanha inna shaniyaka huwa kalta The one who insulted you, he will be cut off. You see this? This is a miracle. This is a miracle. I want to take it a step further. When the companions of the Prophet ﷺ traveled to different lands, they did not come with conquering armies. They intermarried with the people. They benefited from the cultures of the people. And so the knowledge of the people became part of Islamic knowledge. They benefited from the societies. And because we took the knowledge of the ancient ones, the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Phoenicians, the ancient Iraqi, Indian, Chinese, all types of people, and we gave it a Tawhidic, base, we were able to change the course of history. How can I say this? In the period called the Dark Ages of Europe, this was actually the Golden Age of Islam. So when you count in numbers, zero is an Arabic word, sifr. When you count one, two, three, four, five, that came to you through the Arabic language. When you study your math, algebra, this is a jabba, trigonometry, calculus. All of this came from Muslims. The scientific method, the basis of uh, modern medicine, the basis of the modern educational system 
came out of Muslims in the golden age of Islam who preserved the knowledge of the world and put it in a, a useful form that people could then redevelop their societies. And so, why did they do this? Where did they get the energy to do this? Who started the movement that gave them the understanding it was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in the Atay Nakal Kawthar for Salli Rabbika Wanha. The good part of this modern age, the positive part, you can relate it back to Muslims and you will relate it back to Rasulullah Sallallahu who is the one who gave them the direction and the Quran came through him to us. And so it is a standing miracle. And this Quran will continue to be a miracle until the day of resurrection, which is giving people direction in the way they should live. Right now, the world is in crisis. The younger generation is growing up in a world with violence, poverty, disease, traditional values are being broken down, they are growing up in a world that seems to be falling apart. In this Quran, there are answers for society. Because the biggest problem of humanity is when they are cut off from their Lord. We have the solution to this. We have the solution to many of the problems. You know, this is Thursday night. It's going into Friday. For many people in uh, uh, non-Muslim societies, when it gets near the weekend, the closer they get to Friday, the closer they get to the alcohol. <laughs> and when Friday comes, then they get high. And when they come together, it would be impossible to smile and enjoy unless you had something to drink. How can you be enjoying yourself? How can you come on a Thursday night, on, on, on a Friday night, and you enjoy yourself and you smile? You're not high. You know what they found out recently? A Canadian paper in Toronto has revealed that alcohol is worse on a human being than heroin and cocaine. Alcohol does more damage to a person's life than heroin and cocaine. But yet it is propagated to us on the media. It is coming to us. An alcoholic has destroyed his body, destroyed his relationships, abuses his family, or she abuses her family, they get in accidents on the highway. At least 25 people are affected by one alcoholic. We are living in an alcohol-free, a drug-free society. That is something that we need to give to, to, to the people of this world. We are living in a society where we're not exploiting each other's sexuality. We're being taught not to judge people by the color of their skin. We're being taught not to judge people because of their language or their passport. Respect the human being because of their character and not because of the money that they have or because of which country they come from. These are lessons that human beings need right now. What is our relationship with the environment? The Prophet ﷺ showed us that we are the Khalifa, and the Khalifa is not a political term. The Khalifa is the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. That's what Muslims are supposed to be, to take care of the environment, to take care of the ills of society. And so our mission today, really, when the smoke clears, it is to give this final, last testament to the people so that they will have a way to come out of this crisis that the world is in. We're in a terrible crisis. We're in a monetary crisis. If you have a chance to buy gold, buy gold. Because your paper notes that you have in a short time will be out of it now. They're going to be worthless. And there are some people saying within the next 10 years, we may even have a new currency called a metal, which is, which is the peso, the Mexican peso, the US dollar, the Canadian dollar. And if you have $100 Canadian, it will only be worth $1. And if you don't want it, you have nothing. So buy, have land, gold. Our way is to have things which have value in themselves. Not in the paper notes, 
I went to a country on a Dawa mission in the south of Africa. It's called Zimbabwe. Many of you might have heard of Zimbabwe. It's a beautiful country, despite what you hear in the paper. It is a beautiful country. And the people are the most educated people in the southern region. But because of a political situation, their currency, which was higher than the British pound, is now worthless. I went to Zimbabwe and I had $100 and I said, change this for me, brother. He came back with a bag of money like this. <laughs> and I said, I'd like to have a cool drink. And they said, give me $500,000. The money is useless. Every time they, they, they print it, they got to put three more zeros. And then three more zeros. Because it's only paper. That money you're carrying is a promise that there is gold and silver in the bank. There is no longer gold and silver to equal the paper we have. So you need to learn to go back to the land. Learn to plant food. Many of our young people don't know what it's like with food. The young people ask me, where oranges, where do oranges, I said, I said to the young brother, where does oranges come from? He said, it comes from Metro. It comes from the supermarket. He <laughs> said, so, no man, oranges grow on trees. <laughs> Plants. And so in conclusion, we are in a beautiful situation. We, but we will feel uh, a lot of pressure on us. We will feel a lot of pressure. But the Prophet Sallallahu under that pressure is when he would shine. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given us, as, as the ones who have inherited this message, he has given us an abundance. And so I leave you with these words that Allah Azza wa Jal has revealed to us and given to us. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inna a'tainaka al-kawthar. Fasalli li rabbika wanha. Inna shaniyaka kuraqtar. أقول قول هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. جزاك الله خير دكتور عبد الله حكيم كويك. May Allah سبحانه وتعالى give us the benefit of what we heard and دكتور عبد الله still has about seven minutes to go but I think he's trying to prove me wrong. إن شاء الله. Now we give the floor to دكتور رضا بدير. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa la. And at the beginning I would like to thank Dr. Abdullah Hakim Kwek for honoring us with being here with us tonight. And I feel so humbled to speak after him. And I thank all of you for coming tonight. And I'm going to start with a story. One day we went for Umrah. And subhanAllah, there was a young man who was a revert, and he was crying next to the Kaaba. And when we asked him, he was like, why are you crying? Did you lose your money? And this, subhanAllah, when, when, when the Shaykh was talking about the money as being papers, he looked at us and he laughed. He said, no. He said, did you lose your passport? And he said, no. So why are you crying? He said, because I have been a Muslim for two weeks and I have done nothing for Islam. So we turned around to each other and we started asking, how old have you been a Muslim? And what did you do for Islam? We're talking tonight about da'wah. And when we speak about da'wah, you're one of two. That's what the scholar said. Anta imma da'i wa imma mad'u. You either call or you will be called. Meaning, subhanAllah, look at me and you when we are alone at home. And nobody can see you but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes, subhanAllah, the mushaf will be right in front of you. And also next to it is the remote, the remote control of the TV. Which one would you pick? It's amazing that subhanAllah, you go there to get the mushaf to read something and then Shushu will come in and say, you're tired. 
You know? You know, Allah Ghafur Rahim, you just came back from work. Just like get some rest. You know what? Watch the TV to see what is happening to the Muslim Ummah. You know how the tyrants are doing, what they are doing now to the Muslim Ummah. And subhanAllah, look at the trick. So you wanted to go to the Quran, but if you don't have a strong Iman, Shaitan will call you. So at that moment, you have to stop and say, no, I'm going to read some Quran, inshallah. At least, you know, one page or something. But those who are tricked by Shaitan, they will go there. And in fact, when they turn on the TV, it's not going to be the news about the Muslim world. It's going to be something else that you were watching right before. And you'll be tricked. And this is why, subhanAllah, Allah told us in the Quran that Shaitan, you know, told us that trick. And we know that he's going to give a khutbah in Jahannam. May Allah save us all. If you read in Surah Ibrahim, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرِ And Shaitan will say when the matter is decided, that's when the day of judgment. Some people went to Jannah, may Allah make us amongst them. And some people will make it to Hilfar, may Allah save us all. Say Ameen. Ameen is not an Arabic word, it's an Abyssinian word, okay? Now, anybody from Abyssinia here? Sheikh, do you have any relatives from Abyssinia? Okay. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, look at this, we know this from now. Shaitan is telling us, Allah is telling us this in the Quran. <laughs> so what is the message of all prophets? It's the promise of truth. If you become a servant to Allah, you will be successful in the dunya and the akhirah. That's what's going to happen to you. So the promise of Allah is true. Believe it. And submit to Allah. But then Shaitan is saying, And I promised you, but I will never keep my promise. But listen next. I didn't have any authority over you, except I just called upon you. Do this, and you followed me. I whispered. If you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan, you will run away. So you are either making da'wah, or you will be invited by Shaitan. Or your desires, or the temptations of this dunya. You know, you have four enemies. Would you like to know them? At the end, inshallah. <laughs> now let's go to the next question. If I were to ask you, what are the best words ever? You hear this every Friday from Shaykh Mustafa. You hear it tomorrow, inshallah from Dr. Kuk, inshallah, on the member at the beginning of Khutbat al Haja, What do we say? Anybody knows that? You hear it over Jum'ah, come on, I have candy here. Yes, go ahead, Mahfouz. Bismillah, okay, no, I'm not, I'm not listening. Wa alaykum as wa barakat, faddal. Yes. What do we say? Inna asdaq al-hadith Kitab Allah, wa khair al -had. So when I ask this question, I'm going to take the candy because I'm the one who answered, okay? So now, what are the, be what are the best words? The words of Allah. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, The best words are the words that will be used by someone who will make da'wah. No one else will be doing a better job than him. And Allah combined this with something very important. It's not enough to make da'wah, but you have to do righteous deeds. You practice what you preach. Okay, who's claiming to be a Muslim? Raise your hand. One hand, two hands, shame on you. I wish I had four. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us if you claim to be a Muslim, you have to make da'wah. And you have to do righteous deeds. Now, who can tell me what is the best ummah? What is the best ummah? Yeah, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu Is it simply because they belong to the ummah? Are we Muhammadans? How do we translate that love? It translates into actions, right? 
This is why look at the ayah 110 in Surah Al-Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ Look at the wording. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved us to the end of time. And He said, you were the best ummah saved for all people. What are the criteria to be the best ummah? That is the question. This is why Umar radiallahu anh, whenever he used to read this ayah, he would say, Man arad al Whoever wants to be the best, he has to apply and comply with the conditions. First, ta'muruna bil ma'roof. If the ummah wants to go back, what do we need to do? Enjoy what's right. وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ And you stop what's wrong. وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ And you believe in Allah. The scholar said, we're supposed to be believers. But the, it means, the ayah means, you have always to work to increase your iman. And this is why you are here tonight. You want to know something more about your deen. So don't be content with your level of iman. You have always to work on your iman. Because Allah said in the ayah, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا آمِنُوا Allah said in the Quran, Oh, you who believe, believe. What does it mean? Increase your level of Iman. Because it's Islam, Iman, and what's the name of your cousin? Ihsan, mashallah. That's good. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a statement in the Quran. He said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَّةً لِلنَّاسِ We have not sent you, but to all mankind. Another ayah. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you but as mercy for the whole universe. How come that the Prophet ﷺ is sent to all people and he died? How, how can he be sent to the people who will be born tomorrow? So if the Prophet ﷺ died, who's going to carry on the message? Who? Smile and say, me inshallah. Who's going to carry on the message? Are we obligated in the Quran? Did Allah say something about this? That we should make da'wah? Listen to this ayah. Ayah number 108 in Surah Yusuf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي O Muhammad, say to them, this is my way. What's the sabil of the Prophet ﷺ? What's the way of the Prophet ﷺ? أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ I invite people to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. عَلَى بَصِيرَةِ Based on knowledge. أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي I and those who follow me. Who claims here to be a follower of Prophet Muhammad Sallam? If you raise your hand, you are obligating yourself to comply with this ayah. So you have to make da'wah. Can you give me proof from the hadith? Yes. The Prophet Sallam said, بَلِّغُوا عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً وَلَوْ آيَةً Share with the people. You know? Teach them even one verse from the Quran. And the Shaykh made the test, Alhamdulillah, we all passed it, right? Who memorizes Surah Al Kawthar? Who memorizes Surah Al Ikhlas? Hafaz, mashallah. I can compete with Shaykh Mustafa, inshallah, Ramadan. <laughs> mashallah, that's great. So you can't claim that I don't know. But you know, sometimes, again, Shaitan will come to you and say, You don't have a BA in Sharia, yeah? like the Shaykh. So don't make that one, right? And I'm going to ask you a question. When Abu Bakr radiallahu an was invited to Islam, only in one week, he came back with five of those who were promised Jannah while they're still walking on earth. Amongst them is Uthman ibn Affan, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, Abd rahman ibn Awf. Can you tell me what degree did Abu Bakr have in one week? How much of the Quran was revealed at that time? Tell me, how much? How many ayahs? So again, this is a trick of shaitan. And let me tell you something, another story. at tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi is from Yemen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rid the Yemenis from the tyrant. Say Ameen. Ameen. MashaAllah, I'll give you candy. This is an extra Ameen, MashaAllah. Hey, like it? Oh, sorry. Okay, one for harming you. Okay, so forgive me, inshallah. So again, at Tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi, when he came, they warned him, they said, listen, there is a man, 
If you listen to him, he's like a magician. He will brainwash you. And the man who was the leader of his tribe, so they scared him so much so that he started putting cotton into his ears, not to listen to the Prophet. It's the same thing as the Shaykh was sharing with us. Islam is given a bad name everywhere. Look at the news. And that happened also at the time of the Prophet. And the man was so scared, but then at some point while he was doing tawaf, he said, How foolish are you to fight? You're the leader of your, of your tribe. You're a wise man, you're a poet. Everybody looks up to you, and you're scared to listen to a man. Go and listen to him. If he's telling the truth, follow him. If not, just ignore him. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ, and he said, tell me something. And the Prophet ﷺ recited some Quran, and subhanAllah, At-Tufayl accepted Islam. And he said, Prophet of Allah, you know, give me a sign that I will take to my people with me. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua to him, so there was a light in between his eyes. He said, Prophet of Allah, make dua that will, you know, that light will be in my stick because people might think that like, you know, I'm mad or something or something, I'm possessed or something. So the Prophet ﷺ made dua and, you know, the light went to his stick. Guess what? At Tufayl was one man. He went back home to Yemen. And many battles happened. Badr, Uhud, Al Khandaq. And when Khaybar was over, Prophet saw so lots of dust <coughs> coming to the Medina. And he asked, Who's this? He said, This is At Tufayl ibn Amr al Dawsi bringing all his tribe from Yemen accepting Islam. One man, he brought all of his tribe. And guess what? At the very beginning, he felt frustrated like many of us. You go to the people and you try to invite them and they'll turn you a deaf ear or a blind eye. It's like, you know what? May Allah take them to hellfire, inshallah. They're kuffar anyway. Is this our attitude? No. At Tufayl came to the Prophet and he said, Prophet of Allah, I called him to Islam and nobody answered me. Make dua against them, Prophet of Allah. And the Prophet embraced his hands. Learn how to do da'wah. When he raised his hands, everybody said, Halakat Dawus. The Prophet is going to make dua against them now and they're going to be destroyed. The Prophet raised his hand and he said, Allahumma ahdi Dawusan wa atini bihim Muslim. Oh Allah, guide the hearts of Dawus and bring them Muslims. Allah accepted that dua and after Khaybar, all of them came. So make dua for people, don't make dua against them. I know there are some brothers now. You know, you know when they start practicing Islam, I told you before, you know the way they look? They look like this. They'll give you the 111. Smile, Akhi. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> Why? It's like, Nahnu Ummah, La Ta'rif al Hazm. We're a serious Ummah. What does seriousness have to do with you being frowning? The Prophet ﷺ was never seen frowning or angry except when Allah is disobeyed. In fact, Abdullah ibn al-Halas said, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا أَكْثَرَ تَوَسُّمًا مِنَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. I've never seen a smiling face more than the Prophet ﷺ. And then he told them, why do you make dua against your family and against your neighbors? He said, because Noah السلام, made dua against his people. I say, Akhi, you're wrong. Do you know when did he make dua against his people? How many years did Noah give dua? How many years? 950 years. How many seconds did you make down in your life? How many minutes? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَمَا آمَنَ مَعَهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ Only a few people accepted Islam. And subhanAllah. You know, there are different narrations. The highest number I have seen in the tafsir is 80 people. Divide 950 by 80. It means every 12 years, one person became a Muslim at the hands of Noah Every 12 years, one person will accept Islam. Yet he was patient. Now, when did he make dua against them? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, Noah, no one is going to accept Islam anymore. And this is why he said, Innaka inta darhum, he's talking about those kuffar, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sealed their hearts, they're not going to be Muslims. So if you leave them, who's going to be their descendants? 
لا يلد إلا كافرا فاجرا كفارا. So let's go on. Somebody might say, you know what, I'm not going to make da'wah until I have full iman. Isn't this one of the tricks? Doesn't shaitan come to you and say, you know, when you become like, you know, the best Muslim ever. And I'm going to tell you one of two things. You are, you are one of two. Either this is not going to happen until almost you're going to die, so you will miss all your life. Because this ummah, the average age is between 60 to 70, as the Prophet said. Very few who passed, you know, that age. And it's amazing that one woman at the time of Nuh, السلام, she was crying. And Nuh السلام, asked her, why are you crying? She said, like, I lost my child and he's very young. He said, how old was he when he died? She said, 300 years. <laughs> I'm serious. And he said, what if you live during the time that will come when the average span of life will be 60 to 70? She said, what? There will come a time when the average span of life will be 60 to 70? Wallahi la in'ishtu ila hadha la ja'altuha sajdatan lillah. She said, if I live to that time and my life will be 60 to 70 years, I will spend the 60 to 70 years making sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So invest with Allah before it's too late. So you're one of two. Either your iman will be complete, and nobody, by the way, you know, can attain complete iman. Almost at the time of death, and you will miss the chance to make da'wah. Second, you might think at some point, I have full iman, and you look down upon others, and this is pride. And this is the first sin. When Shaitan said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm better than Adam. And why was he being proud? Was it because he achieved something? No, he said, خَلَقْتَنِي مِنْ نَارٍ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِنْ طِيرٍ It's something even given to him. He said, you created me out of fire and you created him out of dust. So when you, when you, when you feel that they achieved something, it should be something that you have done, not something even given to you. So, who would like Jannah? MashaAllah. Now the two hands are up. MashaAllah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Ali radiallahu anhu. He said, one of the ways to Jannah is to make da'wah to Allah. لَإِنْ يَهْدِ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمُرِ النِّعَمِ If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to use you to guide someone to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's better for you than the red camels. And the red camels at the time, this was the best money ever. Because a camel at the time was almost like $100,000 today. So basically we're saying the red Give me the name. Porsche. Porsche. Sheikh, what's the latest? Bugatti. Rolls Royce. Okay. So now, there's another narration the Prophet said, Khairul laka min dunya wa ma fiha. It's better for you than the whole universe and what's in it. Now, would you like to learn from a woman? That's the story that every time it brings tears to my eyes. A woman by the name of Umm Sulaim. The woman was married to a man and then she converted to Islam. And subhanAllah, when she converted to Islam, her husband was still a disbeliever. So when he came back home and he knew that she was a Muslim, he was so mad. And her son is Anas ibn Malik. So her husband was Malik. So subhanAllah, he went out and he was so angry and one of his enemies met him in the street and he killed him. So the woman became a widow. And here comes a very reputable person in the community of Medina called Abu Talha. And he proposed to her, he said, I want to marry you. And she told him, Abu Talha, innaka imru'un mushrik. You're not a Muslim. And our Prophet told us we cannot marry a non-Muslim. And then he went away, and then he tried again. He came back, he said, if it is gold or silver, I can give you a lot. She said, let me tell you something, Abu Talha. What do you worship, Abu Talha? Don't you worship the wood that's made into a god by so-and-so? He said, yes. And she said, if the fire you know, breaks into this wood, would it eat it? He said, yes. He said, is this wise? You worship gods that you make with your own hands? And the man said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. She said, This is my dowry. I don't need any gold. I don't need any silver. And this is why they say in Islam, we have a historian here, 
the best dowry in Islam is the dowry of Um Sulaim bint Malhan. Because her dowry was going to Jannah. She guided her own husband to be a Muslim. Who now cares about their own husbands if they drink or if they don't pray, if they don't do this and this? Listen to another story of people who used to feel, you know, for their family members and they cared about them. Abu Huray radiallahu anh, came to the Prophet and said, Prophet of Allah, every time I make da'wah to my mother to accept Islam, she would say bad things about you. Would you please make du'a for her? Who can do this today? Who will take time to make du'a for his brother or sister, not make du'a against them? And say, oh Allah, guide their hearts. And you know, when you make du'a for someone, the Prophet said, there's an angel who would say, Oh Allah, accept the dua, walaka bimith, and the same for you. You are making the dua, but an angel is making dua for you. Which is better? Subhanallah. So when the Prophet knew that Abu Huraira was sincere, he made dua, he said, Allahumma ahdi, Allahumma ahdi, Umma Abu Huraira. Oh Allah, guide the heart of Umma Abu Huraira. He said, oh Allah, I went back home, my mother was taking a shower, and she said, wait. And then she put in her clothes and she came out like Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. The dua of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Let me conclude. Are you proud to be a Muslim today? Was it obviously? Okay, I'm going to ask you to prove it, but not now, inshallah. Thank you, Annie. I would take it like, you know, because of you are here today, mashallah, so you care about Islam. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, one time, went out, and he wanted to show his Islam, when the Muslims were very few in number. And subhanAllah, he went out to the Kaaba, and on the top of the Kaaba, he stood there, and he started reciting, Ar-Rahman, Allaman Qur'an, and he continued Surah Ar-Rahman. So they all gathered the mushrikeen and they started beating him up until the sahaba came and like they saved him before they were killing him so while he was so weak he said you know what i'm gonna come and see you tomorrow we are set another surah <coughs> i'm not saying to the young brothers here to go out to the square and say hey go far we're gonna do this and this no i'm saying he was proud he was proud of his islam and he was reciting the quran some people today change muhammad the best name ever to Mo and Mike. They changed Hussam to Sam. And Fatima to Faye. And Dalia to Delicious, right? Okay. Now, my question is, Ali radiallahu an was asking the Sahaba when he was the Khalifa, by the way. And this is very deep. He said, Man nas. Imagine Ali is known for what? For his courage. He was asking the people around him when he was the Khalifa. He said, who is the bravest person in Islam? And everybody looked at him as if they're saying, you. He said, no, it's Abu Bakr. And then he shared the story with them. He said, we were very few in number. And we came to the Prophet ﷺ while he was standing by the Kaaba. And he was trying to make da'wah. And there were lots of people around him, somebody pushing him. This is what you expect in da'wah. And somebody pulling him. So he said, we were scared, and we ran to the mountain. And the only one who went to defend the Prophet ﷺ was Abu Bakr. He was not, you know, a fighter like Umar but he's the best man in this ummah. He's the best man after all prophets. So he said to the people, أَتَقْتُلُونَ رَجُلًا أَنْ يَقُولَ رَبِّيَ اللَّهِ are you going to kill a man simply because he's saying my Lord is Allah? So Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyad alayhi min Allahi ma yastahab He pushed Abu Bakr, they left the Prophet and he pushed Abu Bakr on his back and he took off his shoes and he started beating him up until his face, you know, was swollen to the degree that you can't see his nose from his eyes, from his mouth. And they took him back home. When they took him back home, he felt, un he, like, he felt unconscious and everybody said he's dying. SubhanAllah, the first moment he woke up, they were offering him something to eat or drink, he said, what happened to the Prophet What's his main concern? Da'wah. 
So, let me conclude with another story. Do we sometimes make dua and Allah doesn't accept our dua? Say yes or yes. Egyptian democracy. Again, say yes or yes. Yes. Sometimes we make dua. What's it? Oh, mashallah, he wants to. <laughs> You're going to take all my candy tonight, and I'm, I'm happy to do it. So, what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sorry, the Prophet told us the reason. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't accept our dua, it's because we left da'wah. He said, لَتَأْمُرُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَتَنْهَوُنَّ عَنَ الْمُنْكَرِ أَوْ لَيُشْكَنَّ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَعُمَّكُمْ بِعِقَابٍ ثُمَّ تَدْعُوا لَهُ فَلَا يَسْتَجَابُ لَكُمْ You have to enjoin what's right and forbid what's wrong. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish you all. And then you will make dua to him and he will not answer your dua. There was a time when a whole village, a whole city was disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salam to destroy that city. And this is the ad that I'm going to leave you with. And when Jibreel alayhi salam went down, usually he will carry that city on the tip of one of his wings. I will turn it upside down. He found a man who was making sujood and was crying and making dua to Allah. So he went back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to appeal. And he said, Oh Allah, in the Fihim Abdaka Fulan, Sajid Baki Dari. You know, amongst them there is like, you know, your servant so and so, and he's like making sujood, and he's crying, and he's making dua to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Bihi Fabda. Start with him. Destroy him first. In the Hulam Yatamar, watch who. His face didn't turn red, meaning he didn't get angry for my own sake. He only cares about himself. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the ayah, Allah will never destroy the cities. While there are people there who are not only righteous, but they command what's right and they forbid what's wrong. It's not enough to be righteous. So basically, Muslim means da'i. You guide people to what's right and you forbid them from what's wrong. And this is why, subhanAllah, it's an amazing story that I heard on my way here that somebody who was very poor, he saved some money just to go and pay the fees to the doctor. And he was not sick. So when he went to the doctor, the doctor asked him, he said, what's your problem? What are you suffering from? He said, nothing. I just saved the money to come and ask you to save some time to pray because I love you for the sake of Allah. And the doctor started crying and his tawbah was at the hands of that man. Imagine somebody just saving the money to go to the doctor to pay him the fees to see him and say, because I love you and I know that you don't pray, please. Start praying. And that doctor is one of the best dua now back home. When he shared that story of his tawbah, it's because somebody made da'wah to him in a very simple way. Very simple way. Another brother, wallahi, went all the way to Mecca to make umrah. And he kept, you know, by the murtazam, making dua while crying. And when he was asked, who is that person that you're making dua to? He said, one of my close friends because he doesn't pray and he commits sins. And he said, Wallahi, I made the Umrah only for him, just to go there and make dua for him. So when he came back, his friend, in two weeks, started praying and started being a very righteous person. Can we do that? Yes, we can. Can we sacrifice our time? Can we be positive in our da'wah? Wallahi, there was a very simple man who learned only he doesn't have so much knowledge for those who say, I'm going to wait until I learn more and more to make da'wah. He learned only one hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. كلمتان خفيفتان على اللسان ثقيلتان في الميزان حبيبتان إلى الرحمن سبحان الله وبحمده سبحان الله العظيم Two statements that you can make 
They're very light when it comes to saying them on your tongue. But they're very heavy on the scale. Remember when we were talking about the scale yesterday? And then he said, they are very beloved to the most merciful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that man, subhanAllah, wherever he goes, he goes to buy something, he would say, Assalamu alaikum, kalimatani, khafifatani ala lisan, and he would share the hadith. He goes to the doctor, he says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and while he's like treating him, he's going to say, kalimatani. SubhanAllah, they said when he was dying, wallahi, he would pass out, and when he wakes up, the only thing he's saying, kalimatani. And he ended his life like that. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakumullah khair. Dr. Rila, inshallah, we'll open the floor for questions and answers. And before I see some hands, I'm going to share a very uh, brief thought with you. The reason that the misconceptions and the stereotypes about Islam and Muslims are very uh, common and persistent in today's media is because Muslims are not doing enough. They're not doing enough. And of course, the news channels, they have a share in the blame. I've been studying uh, Fox News for four years for my PhD, and I almost get a heart attack every time I see Bill O'Reilly, uh, Glenn Beck, and Sean Hannity speak about Islam and Muslims. And they rarely invite a Muslim to speak for Islam and Muslims. Every time they want to speak about uh, an issue related to Islam and Muslims, they invite uh, an ev a Christian evangelical to speak about Islam and Muslims, a Buddhist, a plumber. Uh, they invite Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck to speak for Islam and Muslims, but they rarely invite a Muslim to speak for Islam and Muslims. What was the last time you saw Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick or Dr. Rida or Sheikh Yusuf Bestis or any other uh, Muslim to represent Muslims? that I can't think of. The other thing is, we have also a share in the blame. We are not doing enough. And I always say that Islam is a winning case, but we have bad attorneys, we have bad lawyers. And others, they have a losing case, a big time, but they have excellent attorneys. If we ask our youth here today, who of you wants to be a doctor? Raise your hands. A doctor. Who wants to be a doctor? MashaAllah. Who wants to be an engineer or a technician? MashaAllah. Who wants to study the field of media to present Muslims in the media? Yeah, you are saying this just to please me, to make me happy. No, you ain't. <laughs> we have more doctors in the Muslim community than patients. And we have engineers than more engineers than cars but who are the where are the muslims who represent us and speak for our challenges and aspirations and pains in the media there are very few so we have to do something and this is my thought and forgive me if i just uh, this is my uh, my passion i want to see some hands inshallah we'll get a question from a brother and a question from a, a sister inshallah Okay, there is a book by Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick, inshallah, The Islamic Revival, 40 Hadith of Islamic Revival, then two uh, dudes are available here, DVDs, I see it as dude, <laughs> two DVDs are available, inshallah, uh, the DVDs were finalist in 2009 and 2010 Al Jazeera documentary film contest uh, it's a good da'wah material to give to non-muslims inshallah uh, questions yeah we'll start with the sister in the back Salam.
Uh, yes, I mean, what we have to try to, to do, you know, to, 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 what the question is, is that um, there's a problem the sister has uh, in, you know, not just the non-Muslims or people of the faith, but it's the Muslims. It's like what we used to call anti-Islam and counter-Islam. Anti-Islam is something given by the media against Islam. But counter-Islam is when Muslims don't practice Islam. That's the worst form of da'wah that there is. And so this causes, you know, a very... But, but what we have to do is, you know, clearly separate Islam from Muslims. Every faith, every way of life has practitioners and people who do not practice. And so, you know, you, you make it clear to them that, you know, the fact that the person is a Muslim does not necessarily mean that they live up to you know, all of the standards of Islam. In most of our cities, I don't know about Edmonton, but in Cape Town, the biggest drug dealers in the city were Muslims. Or well, they came from Muslim families, right? Um, you know, so you, you will find, you know, that there are people, you know, who have Muslim names but not necessarily practice. So, so try to, in a, you know, very clear way, um, separate Islam, you know, from the practices, you know, of some Muslims. But keep going forward and keep being positive, inshallah. I just have a good comment on what you said too. Um, in one of the uh, in one of the battles between the the Muslims and Al Fors, the Persians back in the days, um, and the leader of the Muslims was Al Muthanna ibn Haritha, and the Muslims were winning at the beginning, but yet there was like a tribe in between called Banu Bakr, and unfortunately they betrayed the Muslims. They are Muslims, but they betrayed the Muslims. So listen to this. Al-Muthanna ibn Haritha sent them a message that consists of three words. And that's the message I'm sending myself and all the Muslims today. He said, لا تفضحوا المسلمين لا تفضحوا المسلمين Meaning, do not disgrace the Muslims. And the people, once they heard the message, subhanAllah, Iman pumped in their hearts, and they were the reasons for the Muslims to win the battle. That's what we need to do. Yeah, there is a written question for uh, Dr. Ridham. It is, it is said, if it is said that the Prophet ﷺ will be a Shafi'a intercessor for the Muslims, does this include the Muslims who have lived and died in the land of the Kafirs? based on Dr. Ritter's lecture yesterday. What did I say yesterday? <laughs> did I make a statement like that? Okay, let me, let me just... Um, um, I mentioned last, uh, last night when I showed you the, the stages of the eternal journey, meaning like from life, inshallah, till the end in Jannah, inshallah, say Ameen. Amen. I said one of them is a shafa'a, and we said a shafa'a is only for the Muslims. So we said the first stage is dunya, this life and the, the life in this dunya. So the first stage is life, and then after the worthy life, what happens to us? Share with me. Second stage? Death. So the grave. Third stage? Oh, I have to call my candy back. Resurrection, right? People will be resurrected. And then after that we said there is al shafaa because the day of judgment, al hisab will not start. You know, that will be a long day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, تَعْرُجُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ إِلَيْهِ فِي يَوْمٍ كَانَ مِقْدَارُهُ خَمْسِينَ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ A day that's 50,000 years. People will be sweating until they will run out of water and they will be sweating blood. So they will come close to all the prophets one by one and they will start by Adam. Don't you see what's happening to us? You're the father of mankind. Don't you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him for intercession? He's going to say, I was commanded not to eat from the tree. So every and each one of the prophets will pass us to the next one until it comes to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
And then he said, the Prophet said, I will go and make sujood underneath the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I will be taught certain tasabiyah, celebrations and praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I will say them in my sujood. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to say to me, O oh Muhammad, irfa raksak wa sal tu'ata wa shfa'a tu shafa. O oh Muhammad, raise your head, ask, and whatever you ask will be answered. If it's intercession, you're given it. And this is why, if you understand the dua that you make after Adhan, Allahumma rabba hadi al-da'wat al-tamma wa salat al-qa'ima, ati Muhammadan al-wasila wa al-fadila, wa ba'athu Allahumma maqaman mahmoodan al-ladhi wa'adta. That's maqaman mahmoodan al-ladhi wa'adta. He said, fa'innahu la yabbaghi illa li wahidin min al-bashar. You know, this position will be given to only one amongst mankind. And look at his humbleness, he said, وَإِنِّي لَأَرْجُ اللَّهَ أَنْ أَكُونَهُ And I wish that I would be that person, and it is him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to hadith al-shafa'a. So the Prophet sallam is going to say, what are the first words? He's going to say, Ummati, Ummati, he cares about you. So if the sister or the brother is asking this question, if you want the intercession of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what you need to do is, show that you love him by your actions, and emulate him. So the intercession of the Prophet ﷺ is going to be for his true ummah, not those who claim to be his ummah. And today for the person who will always say, the land of the kuffar, the land of the kuffar, let me tell you one thing. The land belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And tell me and give me an example of one Muslim state and I'm going to immigrate tomorrow inshallah. Is that clear? Is there a country in the world where Islam is applied as a way of life? Say no or no? No. Jazakumullah khair. Yeah. So when that ummah, inshallah, will be established, we'll all immigrate, inshallah. So the scholar said today, يَعِيشُ الْمُسْلِمْ حَيْثُ يَكُونْ أَعْبَدْ لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَأَظْهَرُ لِدِينِهِ وَمُقِيمًا لِشَعَائِرِهِ Meaning the Muslim should live today where he can practice his deen, where he can obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he can show the fact that he's a Muslim. In fact, if you see the real world today, in non-Muslim countries, you are given the freedom to speak, you are given the freedom to practice your deen, more than you are given the freedom in the so-called Muslim countries. Am I right or right? Thank you so much. More questions? Yes, bro. Salam. This uh, question our brother is asking that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us uh, in his book that we should hang on to the rope of Allah altogether and be not divided. So how did we get the present dictators you know, in the Muslim countries? This question needs a whole evening uh, of discussion. But, um, you know, in, in Surah Al-Rad, Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, Inna Allah la yughayru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusim. Allah will not change the condition of the people till they change that which is in themselves. So we change something inside of ourselves. When um, greed, tribalism, oppression, when these issues came into our lives, you know, then we actually went down. In the course that we're doing this weekend, inshallah, I will be looking at the rise and fall of Islam. And one of the best examples is Al Andalus. It is in Spain. So we will go to Al Andalus and we will show the rise of Islam and also the fall. Because we need to understand uh, from history exactly what is going on. There are certain uh, thawabit, there are certain uh, you know, set systems in life and in history. You know, in Sunnatullah. So, so when Muslims became greedy, uh, tribalistic, materialistic, uh, and start worshipping other than Allah Azza wa Jal, then we were brought low. In the last 200 years, since 1883, there was a big conference in Germany, the Berlin Conference, and this is where they divided up the Muslim world. It's the present day colonial system. 
So you will see the colonial system, how it is set up. That, that foreign forces were, were, you know, occupied our countries and instituted, um, you know, foreign laws, uh, you know, in our country. But they would not have been able to do that unless we had not become weak within ourselves. So we can't blame anybody else, really, uh, ultimately, but ourselves. But you need to see the whole process uh, of where we've gone through in our history. And we can say that, uh, alhamdulillah, we're coming out of it now. We're actually on our way back up. You can see what happened uh, in Tunisia, Tahrir Square, and in many places around uh, you know, the Muslim world now. People are waking up, and we are on our way back up, inshallah, uh, to, to uh, you know, the, the original thing, which inshallah will be khilaf uh, ala min hajj to return to the proper Islamic rule. Yes, there's just one uh, <coughs> comment before we get the question from the sister. The revival of Islam and the improvement of our condition with our leadership in, in Muslim countries starts with ourselves. Because we keep complaining about dictators in Muslim countries and we ourselves, some of us, are dictatorial in dealing with their children and wives and their husbands. So you have to fix your relationship between yourself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fix your relationship with the people. And Allah knows best. Yes, sister? Where? Yes. Okay, basically the question uh, is uh, that our sister is dealing with uh, people of other faiths, and many of them happen to be men. And so, um, you know, they, um, how to negotiate, or how to um, keep, have limits, the do their limits are different. So, so how do you naturally do that? You know, it's, it's, it's like a body language, you know, really it's not, um, it's something that for some people you can explain, you can explain to them that in our religion, you know, we, um, you know, we have great you know, respect for each other, you know, and, and, we, and we keep limits. But sometimes it's a body language. Like for instance, you may be in certain situations where you, you, know, you walk in and, and before they reach their hand out, then you sort of like say, good morning, and you nod like. You know, so therefore the person realizes, okay, that's your way of doing it. So they'll do it to you. So you know, it's, it's you know, try to be natural, not not unnatural in it, but you need to be clear, you know, with people, because people will deal with you as to how you deal with yourself. Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, in the beginning, breaking the ice with the person and just, you know, making contact, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But once it starts to get personal and it starts to get a little bit deep, then it is better to connect that person with a brother. Uh, similarly with a brother, with a sister. Because many brothers will say, um, you know, I'm giving dawah and, you know, like the majority of people accepting Islam are women. So, like, what should I do? So we say to the brother, okay, you begin it, but then we have to have sisters in dawah as well. Because many of our brothers, they will give shahada on one hand and nikah on the other hand. They'll marry on the other hand. So, so really, um, you know, there's, you know, when it starts to get personal in a natural way, 
connect the person with somebody else because um, you know it's, it's it's not safe these days really how things happen in relationships. No, I think this government has happened. Salam. 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 Okay, um, this, you know, this is a local question um, you know, that, that you're sort of dealing with. However, um, these times that we're living in you know, are very confusing. Well, this, 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 this. Yeah. Okay, well basically, I, I can see what you're saying, you know, if you come uh, tomorrow night, inshallah, I will be, do, I will be dealing with uh, uh, Islamic revival, 40 hadith of Islamic revival. And uh, this is a menaj, this is a program of revival. And, and the bottom line for Muslims today is to really revive, you know, Islam. And it is so important for us, you know, to get the message across to the, the, the Canadian people, to the people of these lands. Because it is only when the people of the lands themselves uh, understood the message historically that the message was able to flourish in these lands. And so our masjids, to a great extent, I'm not, I don't necessarily know the situation here, but many of our masjids you know, were just built to protect us, to keep our Islam. Now we have to share the good aspects of Islam with the public so that people of the, the soil itself you know, accept Islam and then, inshallah, you will see a different relationship with the country itself. Many of our young people also growing up, you know, are, are, are children of the soil of the land as well. And so it is really that revival of Islam, you know, to be positive, you know, and, and, and to go forward. It may appear to be negative in some ways, but this is a process we're going through. It's a great, it's a storming process. It's like a giant who is sleeping and he wakes up. The first few minutes he's a little bit groggy. He's not sure which way to go. But now he's starting to wake up, and that's really what the, what the Ummah is now waking up, and, uh, and inshallah soon you will, you will see uh, the results coming through. Now. So I will get one last question because we got only a few minutes for Salat al maghrib inshallah. Yeah, we'll see soon. So who's the atheist? Um, is the question general or for Dr. Kuhn? Huh? Okay. How can you make da'wah to an atheist? Um, first of all, if the person claims to be an atheist, that in itself, subhanAllah, is at some point he's trying to, you know, deny that Allah exists, so he thought about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows that he exists, to start with. And I'll just like share a personal story with you that I shared in, in my halakas maybe more than one time. I was chatting on the internet with someone and he asked me, he said, um, what's your name? And then I said, my name. And to him, this is like gibberish. He said, like, whatever. And it's like, where are you from? I said, an Egyptian in Kuwait. At that time, I was teaching at the College of Sharia in Kuwait. And then he said, oh, you must be a Muslim. I said, who told you this? Stop generalizing. You know, and he said, your guys in the Middle East are all Muslims. I said, this is ignorance. 
Because in Egypt there are 10% Christians. In Lebanon there are 30% Christians. In Syria, so, it's like, oh, I didn't know that. I said, like, because you're ignorant, so you need to educate yourself. Then I started asking him, I said, what's your name? And he told me he happened to be a professor at the university. He's from the States. I said, what's the name of the state next to you? He said, I don't know. Now, I moved on to the question of, he asked me, he's like, you know, I said, why do, you, why do you claim that I'm a Muslim? So what about you? What do you believe in? He said, I'm an atheist. I said, no, you're not. He said, what? I said, no, you are not. And I can prove it to you in less than 10 minutes. He said, okay, let's go for it. I said, okay. How do we communicate now? He said, through the internet. I said, I'm a kafir when it comes to the internet. I don't believe in the internet. Have you seen the internet? Did you touch the internet? Can you send me a piece of the internet? He said, no, I said, there's nothing called the internet. Okay, let's continue. How to communicate now? I said, through the computer. I said, what's a computer? You mean the random combination of electronic circuits and pieces of plastic together that made itself into that thing? He said, no, this is the sophisticated work of an electronic engineer. I said, have you seen the electronic engineer putting that computer together? He said, no. I said, there are no electronic engineers. And he said, okay. I said, how can you get your computer to work? He said, through power, electricity. I said, have you seen electricity? Have you ever touched, can you send me a piece of electricity by mail? He said, no. I said, there is nothing called electricity. Man, we live in Africa. And then the next question was, where do you put your computer? He said, like on a table. I said, oh, that random combination of pieces of wood that put itself together? He's like, no, this is the artistic work of a carpenter. I said, have you seen the carpenter putting it together? He said, no. I said, I don't believe in carpenters. There are no carpenters. He's like, you're confusing me. I said, can we compromise? He said, yes. I said, what about this? We will call the computer electronic engineer that you believe in because I haven't seen him, we'll call him the computer maker. Does this make sense to you? He said, yes. I said, write it down. Now, who made the table? You call him what? He said, carpenter. I said, I would accept if you say table maker. Does this make sense to you? He said, yes. I said, let's move on. Do you have a camera? I said, yes, I turn it on, please. <laughs> and then we started looking at each other. It's like, do you see me? It's like, yeah. I said, are you terrified? Because they call us, as the sheikh said. <laughs> Terrorists. This is, I don't know what's next, but this is the last one, right? I said, Mr. Terry, are you terrified? He said, like, no. I said, okay. So, look at me and look at you. How many eyes do you have? He said, two. I said, how many noses do you have? He's like, one. I said, do I have the same? He said, yes. I said, how many ears do you have? He said, two. I said, they can never be bigger than mine. And then, we came to the conclusion. I said, can you make a conclusion? He said, yes. I said, what is it? He said, the one who made me is the one who made you. He said, write this down. Call him man maker. Write it down. So he wrote it down. I said, let's go back to decipher, decode. How do you say man maker? Because you see men who are made, like you and me. I said, do you have to see your grandparents to believe that they existed? He said, no. I said, why do you believe that they existed? Because we can see you. You're one of their descendants. Now let's go back up. So, who made the computer? He said, the computer maker. I said, no, give him the real name. Because when we see the computer, we said there is someone who made the computer. And we call the computer maker an electronic engineer. I accept it now. I believe in the computer engineers. It's like, okay. I said, let's go down. Who made the table? He said, the table maker. I said, no. We don't have to see the carpenter because we see his work, which is the table. So I believe in carpenters now. Then the last one was, so there is man maker. He said, yes. I said, take it and put the real name. He said, what is it? I said, God. He said, man, I believe in God. I said, I told you. I told you. You are ignorant. You just need to learn. So it was eight minutes and I went and it's time for my yeah, it's almost time for Maghrib. Jazakallah khairan, our uh, speakers for, for today, Dr. Abdullah Hakim Kwek and Dr. Rida Bidir. And we thank our audience for coming and for your questions.